I'm in a weird place right now because I played a, a bullied kid on national television. Where, you know, 20 million people a week watched me get pushed into lockers and and thrown on floors and you know called called a, a faggot, called queer, called you know all the, all, the, all these negative things. And I experienced all that uh, my, myself in, in in real life. And uh, I really like I I let people know that that was you know one of the reasons why they were maybe connecting to my performance so much was because it was coming from such a real place. And I let people know that I was I was bullied horribly when I when I was a kid. I was bullied so badly in middle school that my mom actually took me out of school and, and started homeschooling me just to because because the harass the harassment got got so severe. Um, but I'm out of this weird place right now where I feel like I'm so not a victim anymore that that I kind of. I don't know, maybe that's my ego. I don't know. I think I think I get I get tired of being associated with with someone who who uh, is bullied because I I don't allow that to happen anymore at all. I'm I'm proud of kind of where I'm at, at now because because the minute I see someone who tries to take advantage of me or or or, or is isn't kind, I I, I have the uh, the option to walk away now, which I didn't I didn't when I was a kid. Hey everyone, welcome to Impact Theory. Today's guest is a multi-hyphenate creator best known for his star-making turn on the smash hit television series Glee. For 121 episodes across six seasons, he played Kurt Hummel, the openly gay teenager with the unbelievably beautiful voice. It ended up being the role of a lifetime, but the combination of having grown up in a very conservative family from a small town outside of Fresno, California, and getting cast fresh out of high school at the age of just 18, the idea of taking the role actually terrified him. But take it he did, and millions of people tuned in every week to watch him and his fellow cast members perform. Along the way, he earned not only a massive following of ardent fans from all over the world, but he won a Golden Globe, a Screen Actors Guild Award, and three People's Choice Awards. But being a world-famous actor with one of the most recognizable voices on the planet was not enough for him. And since departing the show, he's not only continued his Hollywood career as a triple threat who can also write, direct, and produce, he's managed to turn himself into a number one New York Times best-selling author with 15 published books to his name. He's even working with 20th Century Fox and Disney to turn his first book in the Land of Stories series, The Wishing Spell, into a major motion picture which he himself is slated to helm. All of this would be amazing and completely dazzle anybody at any age, but it becomes truly mind-boggling when you consider he hasn't even reached his 30th birthday yet. So please, help me in welcoming the man Time Magazine named as one of 2011's 100 Most Influential People, the incredibly talented Chris Colfer. Thank you so much. Brother, how are you doing? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just come with me everywhere and, and repeat that? That was the plan. <laughs> I thought if I write this well enough, you and I can go to Comic Cons together, oh which is exactly what I want to talk about. Yeah. I think that you and I share maybe a vision on how story can be used mm -hmm. to impact people. Certainly hearing you talk a lot about um, as a kid, sort of coming up with stories and that being a big part of your formative mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. is something I can very much relate with. Yeah. What is it about storytelling and Comic Con in particular mm -hmm. that is interesting to you? Oh gosh, well I think it's all a matter of fantasy, isn't it? Um, for, for me, I, I, I always loved um, superhero uh, novels and graphic novels and movies and I loved uh, uh, stories about witches and wizards because in those worlds you get to be whatever you want to be. Um, and uh, I think sometimes there are so many limitations in reality that uh, those kinds of stories can be very, very encouraging. Um, in a fantasy, in, in a comic book, a, a mouse can, can slay a dragon if it's courageous enough. Uh, and that can be very, very therapeutic for those of us who haven't quite slayed our dragons yet. Mm, that's really interesting. As a kid, when did you start to feel ostracized? I know that you talked about being bullied as a kid. When did that kind of stuff start? Oh gosh, at birth. <laughs> I think my, my nuclear family was very small, but my extended family was very large, and uh, I was very much the runt of that family. So I, was, I always was kind of the person that got made fun of the most because I was the youngest. Uh, so yeah, it start, started at home, and then and then uh, things just got worse when I when I went to school. I uh, 
I was a very, very eccentric kid. I do not know how my parents did it. I, I, I think of some of the things that I did and, and said, and I, I, I don't know how I was not, how I was not killed. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, was, I was very different. I, um, growing up, my, my dad was really funny. And uh, I remember trying so desperately to, to be like him because I thought if I, if, I, if I learned to make people laugh, I would be on their good side instantly. Um, and I think I tried that a little too much. I, I think I, I think I alienated a lot of uh, friendships when I was uh, early on in in, in uh, like, like elementary school because of that. Was um, it like an Andy Kaufman kind of humor approach, or what was it about that? that I'm alienated not sure people? there was a style to it. I think I just any any for me anything was fair game. I just wanted to make people laugh because to me, if you could make people laugh, you you were their friend instantly. Um, and then as I got older, I, I think I, that interest sort of changed into sto- storytelling because I, th- I think as a young person, uh, writing was the only way I could get anyone to listen to me and, or, or, or to hear me out without someone wondering what was wrong with my, with my voice. Um, and so that became a very, um, a very uh, useful tool as I, as I got older. So... Uh, your voice then, which of course now you become incredibly famous for and it becomes a thing that just singles you out so rapidly uh-huh. and you have such an amazing singing voice. Oh, thanks. But that was like a, a sore, real sore spot for you? Oh, absolutely. Up? Oh, it was, it was what I was made fun of for the most uh, growing up. It's actually gotten much deeper as, as I've gotten older, believe it or not. Uh, but uh, uh, that was the quickest way someone could, uh, could uh, insult me um, and they did. I grew up in a very, very conservative town where, you know, being different was not accepted. It was, it was, uh, you, you know, just just having a high pitched voice was like you were, you were, you were the outcast. Just, just for that. Um, so um, I, I remember people, even adults, even teachers would, would 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 give me these looks when they would when they'd hear me speak. And um, and I, I I I was I was a very talented singer. Um, and I I could sing. Uh, I could sing like the song Defying Gravity, like no one's business. I could I could sing all of uh, the high parts in Phantom of the Opera, uh, but that meant I was useless to any choir director or any uh, uh, drama drama teacher. Interesting. So you weren't. I always, I guess, sort of imagined that your real life was very Glee esque in that you were singing all through middle school and high school. It, it was. I, I and I definitely did. I, I, I sang in the choir. I, I quit choir because I, I got tired of standing. Um, uh, <laughs> I was in a lot of school plays. I, I was never, uh, I was never the lead role or, or, or anything. I, I was always, I always had, had small roles in the, in the background. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it's, it's interesting. I, I think, um, I think, uh, I hope, I hope, I hope I'm not patting myself on the back. I, I think I, I played that character in Glee very, very well. And, and people, uh, really do think I was playing myself and, 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 and although we were experiencing, um, very, very similar things, um, uh, uh, I was very, I, I was very different from that character. Um, I, I'm much more cynical than that character. <laughs> That's interesting. In fact, so I'm glad you huh. brought that up. Mm-hmm. I heard you in an interview. Somebody asked you if you were a character from Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. who would you be? And you said, I want to say that I would be mm-hmm. the mother of dragons, but I think I'm actually Cersei. Yeah. What did you mean by that? I, I'm sorry. I just, she's a woman who knows what she wants and, and she goes out and she gets it. I mean, she, you know, her methods and her, her strategy is a little questionable, you know, but, uh, I think that's fair to but say. I just, I don't, I, I love anyone with a, with a, with a drive. And, um, I remember when I was in senior year of my high school, uh, I was chosen, uh, to put on my own show. It's called the senior show. Um, and, and every year one senior in the, in the drama class got selected to, to basically put on whatever they wanted. And, and uh, usually they uh, they would do like SNL type you know variety sketch kind of kind of shows, um, but I was like, nope, I'm writing a musical, and uh, I uh, gender reversed uh, Sweeney Todd uh, and called it Shirley Todd, um, uh, so I could be so I could be Mrs. Lovett, so I was Mr. Lovett, um, and uh, because we were all seniors, no one wanted to do it. Uh, I ended up I ended up blackmailing all of them to to, to be in it. Um, and uh, it was a great show. Walk me through how that drive and ambition has manifested in your life. Um, Is that something you value in yourself? Is it something that you're skeptical of in yourself? Because you, when you answer that question, and I fully understand that it was a little tongue in cheek, but when you say that I'm, you know, I fear that I'm actually Cersei, um, is there part of you that is very cognizant that there is a line that you can cross with drive and ambition or? Oh, I think so. I think I, I've never quite gotten to the point where I was so ambitious, for, where I was, I was causing harm. But um, I, I think I think ambition is is 
so much of who I am, uh, maybe to a fault, but never, never to, to the point where I, where I feel like I'm, I'm harming anyone or, 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 or anything. Um, I think growing up, a- ambition and hopes and goals and dreams, that, that was literally all I had. My, my family didn't have much money and, and I, didn't, I, I wasn't good looking and, and I wasn't athletic. Um, uh, I, I, I could act, I could sing, I could, I could write, but there aren't many uh, areas for you to, to, to do that in when, when you're a young person. Uh, at least when I was a young person, there, there weren't. And so I, I think my ambition sort of just became my imaginary friend. Um, it was a survival tool. It, it wasn't narcissism, it was, it was survival. In that, I can be somewhere else one day, I can be bigger than this, mm-hmm. I can go places. Yeah. Was that the sort of savior mechanism? Yeah, I, I think it was making a treasure map to a life that was better than what I was in currently. I, 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 that's that's what really what, what it was for me. Um, hence why I also I, I identified so much with fantasy and, and superhero uh, uh, and Greek mythology and... and um, and, and literature. Um, it was all part of a, yeah, I, I, I always used uh, fictitious peoples as my examples of, of, of getting somewhere. Give me some examples. Who were people? Oh gosh, Harry Potter, I guess. That's a good one. Um, what is it you like about Harry Potter? Oh God, what, oh my God. It's like, Harry Potter was like my religion growing up, so it's a hard, hard, to, hard to answer. Um, I don't know if it was actually him because, because I, gr- when I was reading Harry Potter, he, he wasn't even he wasn't my favorite character by by a long shot. He I, I loved Ron, and Hermione, and Professor McGonagall. Those are the characters that I love. But I think I think Harry Potter just in general was um, when I was a kid. I, I that was just the first time I ever remember enjoying reading. Um, I had dyslexia. I was not a good reader. I um, I, I needed uh, reading glasses to, to read, and I didn't find that out much later in life. So reading physically hurt me and. Uh, it wasn't until I was in junior high school when I, I told a teacher that, and they said, "Well, you really should get your eyes checked." And I did, and lo and behold, I was I was farsighted. So Harry Potter was 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 a huge introduction to literature for me, um, and uh, it it inspired me to to be a storyteller myself. So. I think it's interesting that you didn't find Harry Potter to be the most compelling character. I find that a lot. I even find mm-hmm. that sometimes when I'm writing that mm-hmm. making the main character mm-hmm. the most interesting, the most intriguing when they have so much sort of heavy lifting to do can sometimes be difficult. Whereas mm-hmm. you can make a mm-hmm. side character be mm-hmm. a little more flippant. Yes. They can yeah. be a bigger personality, a mm-hmm. very specific flavor, if you will. Um, what was it about a Ron or a Hermione or a Professor McGonagall that actually really drew you in? And how were you using what you were reading as a way to deal with what you were going through? And so let that hang in the air for a minute. Mm-hmm. Because one thing that I heard you say, which I think is really interesting, is I was bullied pretty relentlessly, but it is not a daily thing for me. And that if people didn't ask me about it in interviews, I wouldn't even think about it. Mm. That is so extraordinary that you've been able to get out of that. So part of what I want to package up for the listener at home right now is like, how do they take anything? It doesn't even have to be a fictional story, but what were those things that you got from those characters, even if it was just escapism, and then you you leveraged that breathing room to center yourself or whatever it was but how did you use that to not be diminished by the bullying hmm I was, yeah um well i think it's 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 all about vulnerability um to, to tie those two questions together i think uh uh one of the reasons why audiences respond to secondary characters rather than the lead character is because the lead character usually if, it, if it's written really well uh, you know, shows its heart, their heart on their sleeve, um, and uh, you you relate to them with vulnerability, with, with you know, with their fear and with, and with their with their desires. Where uh, the other characters, you're not quite as connected to them, so they can just be. Um, they 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 are pure escapism. They they are they are they are the, the people that you want to be because because you're not quite as familiar with with, with their with their challenges as you are the main character. Um, but uh, yeah, and and to, and to and to go back to what you said about bullying is. I'm in a weird place right now because I played a, a bullied kid on national television. Where, you know, 20 million people a week watched me get pushed into lockers and and thrown on floors and you know called called a, a faggot, called queer, called you know all the, all, the, all these negative things. Um, and I experienced all that uh, my, myself in, in in real life. And uh, I really like I I let people know that that was you know one of the reasons why they were maybe connecting to my performance so much was because it was coming from such a real place. And I let people know that I was, I was bullied horribly when I, when I was a kid. I was bullied so badly in middle school that my mom actually took me out of school and, and started homeschooling me just to, because, because the, harass, the harassment got, got so severe. Um, but I'm out of this weird place right now where I feel like 
I'm so not a victim anymore that, that I kind of, I don't know, maybe that's my ego. I don't know. I think I, think I, get, I get tired of being associated with, with someone who, who uh, is bullied because I, I don't allow that to happen anymore at all. I'm, I'm proud of kind of where I'm at, at now because, because the minute I see someone who tries to take advantage of me or, 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 or is, isn't kind, I, I, I have the, uh, the option to walk away now, which I didn't, I didn't when I was a kid. Um, but I feel like I have to, at a certain point, I have to stop talking about it because I've told so many million, I've told millions and millions of kids around the world that that is something you get to leave behind. Um, but because, because of my circumstances, I, I don't get to leave it behind because I'm always asked about, about, about it. And it's a good thing to talk about because, because it's, it's still going on. But um, at a certain point, I feel like I'm doing, I'm doing the kids who look up to me a disservice when, 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 I, when I keep talking about it because it does, maybe for them, does seem like it doesn't, it doesn't leave me. Does that make sense? It does, definitely. Yeah. If these were gonna be the last words that you ever spoke on the subject of healing from being bullied, what would you want people to understand? Like, what was your process mm. to close that chapter, to feel good about yourself, and mm. I'm definitely putting words in your mouth, but to be reborn in some way where that is, is not who you are anymore? Mm. Well, I think it's, it's, it's really just knowing that, that you, you get to move on from it. That, that, that's the thing is, is you, you look, adolescence is the toughest time in your life, I think, because you are, you have, you have no freedom, but you have all the responsibility. You are uh, expected to make adult decisions, but you don't get the benefits of, 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 of being adult. And you are literally trapped in, in an environment, high school, uh, unless you're homeschooled, uh, where you are around, you, you have no control over who you're around. And, and, um, the, the, probably the one the most the, the lesson or the the bridge that I've crossed in my life that has given me the most relief is knowing that I I don't have to be in any environment that I that I do not want to be in um, and I, I think that would that would that would be the message that I'd give the kids uh, who are being bullied but also also look the world is 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 full of assholes like like the, the bullies bullies they, they 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 do go away at a certain point but there will always be people in your life that that uh, you don't you don't like that that are that are mean that are that are rude and and um, I think sometimes when you when you when you do go through a period of, of harassment especially when you're young you do learn how to how to overcome that and how to um, maybe not have maybe not have peace with um, maybe have some inner peace uh, it's not really outer peace because you can never really control control the world around you but but you you do you do you do learn a lot you learn a lot of good communication skills I think how, how do you think about identity creation. So um, I think a lot about the notion of really deciding what story you're going to tell yourself about who you are. Mm -hmm. And that in that story, whatever you're repeating to yourself is gonna become your reality because you're gonna see that over and over and over. Mm -hmm. um, was, is that a tool that you use? Like I know that people originally, it was hard for you to convince them that you could write. Mm -hmm. So they're like, well, you're obviously a very talented actor, you're a very talented singer, but can you really write? Yeah. So did, <laughs> right. how in, in when people are telling you that you're not good enough, mm -hmm. which is crazy to think there was ever a time where people thought that about your voice. Oh, thank but you. But if people were telling you about you that about your voice, you obviously mm -hmm. overcame that. Mm -hmm. And then they're telling you that about your writing, but you overcome that. Mm -hmm. So how do you leverage, or maybe it's not narrative or self-narrative, maybe it's something else, but how do you get the courage to do things that people are telling you you can't do? Oh, that's such a, such a good question. Um, you know, it's so interesting is, is I have been told I, I, I can't do something my entire life. It's, it's almost now it's like a rite of passage for me. When, when someone tells me I can't do something, I, I'm like, oh, okay, there's, there's proof that I, that I can do it. But it was never, it was never about my ability, um, if I recall. It was, it, was, it was always about, basically, the world's just not ready for you yet. Um, uh, you know, I was told the world's not ready for someone like you to start singing. You know, you sound like a girl. No one wants to buy an album from a, from a guy who sounds like a girl. The world's not ready. Uh, the world's not ready to see you as an actor. No one's going to want to go to a movie theater to, to see someone like you act, uh, or see someone like you on, on TV. Uh, people actually say this to oh, your face. Oh, to my face. Oh yeah. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. It, 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 and I mean, now, now in hindsight, it's always, always, it's always a gift, but, but yeah, no, I, I can't believe these people. I've never felt the need in my entire life to tell someone they couldn't do something. Sometimes I tell them, oh, that's going to be a challenge and you, you got to be ready for this, this and that. But, but I've never, ever had the need or the desire to, to nip someone's dream in the, in the bud. What's your initial emotional reaction when somebody says that? That I can't do something? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, I'm kind of numb to it now because, because I, I um, 
Well, and it, I have to be honest, like, like one of the reasons why I've accomplished so many things is because I've been very lucky. I've, I've, had, um, I've had many opportunities that, that were just, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, uh, I did do you have really to, believe that? Um, yes, I do. But I do also believe that I had to build on that. I, I, had, to, I had to create the, the steps that I took. I had to form my own ladder from, you know, I had to use that as, 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 a, as a stepping stone. Um, and uh, that, that, I, that I think I, I can take credit for as, as using one experience, uh, uh, my, my Glee experience, using that to, to go into so many different um, ventures was, was because I, I, I luckily, uh, have, I've always been, I've, you know, the story of the grasshopper and the ant, I've always been the ant. So uh, I'm, I'm very proud of myself for, for creating those Tell people what that means. Uh, I've, always been, I've always been one to work hard uh, e even even when uh, when a reward or, or or luck comes my way, I've always been one to try to turn that blessing into a blueprint. That that's a really interesting take on you. And as much as I researched you before you coming on, there's nuance in here that I didn't pick up, which I really uh, I'm super excited by in your story. Oh, that so, makes me nervous. No, no, no. For people that don't know the, like, the details of the grasshopper in the end, it's a great little parable about this grasshopper who's playing around and like, oh, there's plenty of time. It's summer. Everything's mm. abundant. It's all good. Mm. And he's playing the fiddle or something, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And all yeah. the ants are like preparing, preparing, preparing. And they're like socking food away and carrying it back. And they're just working like dogs through the whole summer. Mm -hmm. And they keep telling him like, hey, it isn't going to be like this forever. Mm -hmm. So you better get ready. Yeah, winter is coming. Right. Yeah. And so it becomes like that mm -hmm. ultimate parable about make hay while the sun is shining, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. time where you think it's party time is actually the time to buckle down and do the work. Mm -hmm. And dude, writing your intro, I was like, what the fuck? Like the number of things that you've done is 15 books. It's amazing. <laughs> it's you. fucking wonderful, man. And like hearing you, one thing people will not appreciate unless they actually go watch the videos, you get heckled in the most beautiful way whenever you go to speak. Like the audience, I've never seen audiences that like reactive to almost every word out of your mouth elicits like this audible reaction from people in the audience. You've obviously touched them with your writing, you've obviously touched them with your music and your acting, but it's really interesting. So the, the drive, the being the ant, I think is, is super, super interesting. So when did you realize you're the ant? When did that crystallize as a value for you? And why do you think that's important, if you think it's important for other people? Well, gosh, I think it, it crystallized for me um, in uh, the midst of Glee, uh, because I was finally in, in, in a position that I had been told my entire life, I, I, someone like me would never be in this position. And the minute that I had that position, um, and, and people found out that I was a, a gay actor playing a gay character, um, I, I had an, av an av avalanche of, of doubt, not, not my own, but from other people saying, well, you know, this is, I think one of the first one of the first critiques that was ever written about me was, um, you know, he's great on the show. It's a shame that he'll never do anything else again, just because based on other careers and and other other actors that had that had come. And uh, I think that really um, put a fear in me that they were correct. Um, and I I was so ornery at the time, being a young person. I was like, no, I I'm not going to I'm not going to go gently into that night. You know, I'm I'm going to do whatever I can. Uh, to make sure that I that I um, always have always have a place at the table, um, and so yeah, I, I guess I guess my a lot of my drive used to come from, from proving people wrong, and now I think it it, it, it does come from uh, wanting just to make the world an easier place for, for for someone like me. I think that is that is what I'm driven by now. Um, really what was, this was the second part of your question. Well, even more yeah. interesting, you just said something that I really want you to invite people in to understand because I think it's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. I get that you, you don't do it anymore, maybe not as much. Mm -hmm. Take us back to you're young, you're being you know, hounded by people intentionally or otherwise, where they're telling you you're not going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, I know you're getting death threats. Mm -hmm. So how do you use the chip on your shoulder to prove people wrong, which I'll call sort of a dark energy. Mm -hmm. How do you use that to create something so incredible? I had had a bucket list from the time that I was five. Um, and that I think that truly is the, the, the greatest blessing I think I've ever received in my life is just having a list of things I wanted to do to keep me motivated. And I don't know where it came from. I, I, I don't know how I developed it so young, but um, I, from, my earliest memory, I, I knew that I wanted to act and I knew that I wanted to write. 
um, and uh, and then it was it was it was it made life a lot easier, I guess, because because I just I knew what I, I knew what I what I wanted to do, and um, I was very lucky because I had a grandmother who just believed in me to a fault. Like she would tell me, "You're here, you're here to do this. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen." And even when I would get was she this, talking about the writing or the acting? both both. She really made me think that anything that I wanted to accomplish could happen. Um, and uh, I've said this before, but I, but I think that is the greatest gift you can give a child, even if even if you don't think that that it, that it is possible. And many years later, my grandmother <laughs> told me uh, told me I, I I can't believe you got it all done. Like I, I like I was encouraging, but I never thought you would actually get it all done. But you did, and and I'm like, well, well, thanks. I think it was it was uh, it was the delusion that that you installed in me that that made it all work for me. You've said that your grandmother was your first and toughest editor, she was, which yeah. I think is amazing. Yeah. Do you think that like I'll, I'll ask a two-part question. Mm. Part number one, mm. are you actually glad when she didn't think your story was good enough that mm. she would crumple it up, throw <laughs> it away, and say you can do better? Are uh -huh. you actually glad that happened? Because uh -huh. that had to be kind of hard. Oh, it was traumatic, yeah. So uh -huh. that's part one. Yeah. And then part two of the question, mm. would you do the same if you had kids? Oh my God, oh. Well, I think the first part is uh, yes. I. I, I now I am, I am glad that uh, my grandmother did that. Uh, because it uh, actually made you better? Uh, I think it did. Yeah, I, th I think it did. And I, I think um, it, it also, oh, it's so weird. And I've never put this, I've never put this two and two together. But I think that experience actually uh, made me seek people who are, seek honesty um, in my career rather than just someone who's going to tell me everything that I want to hear. Um, because I know, I know the honesty is what, is, is what gets you from A to B. Uh, the, the coddling doesn't. Um, so yeah, I think I am glad that she that, that she did that, um, as dramatic as it was uh, in, in the time. Um, and I uh, I would say no, I don't think I could I don't think I could ever do that to to a kid. And that's that's uh, that's one of the reasons why I, in all honesty, don't want to have kids is because I don't think I could I could I could uh, uh, I would be such a coddler. I would coddle them to death. They, they would be useless to the world. <laughs> so um, yeah, so yes and no to those questions. That is exactly how I feel about having kids. Yeah. Like. I, I know it's the right answer. Even in my own life, it's been the things that were super hard that actually like, there, I have been in, um, there have been times in my business career where I've been involved with people that I would just call straight abusive. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And so it's like, me okay, mm -hmm. this is actually making me better. It's mm -hmm. horrible and mm -hmm. I do not like it. But the gyrations it makes me go through mentally toughening up, getting more strategic, having to sharpen my skill set. All of those things have made me better. Mm -hmm. But yet now as an employer or if I were to have kids, I wouldn't do that to somebody else. Even though I know that mm -hmm. for some subset of the people, it mm -hmm. is the right answer. Right, right. Like I don't think you get somebody great mm -hmm. that doesn't go through the hardship. But mm -hmm. my problem is hardship destroys so many of the people that it touches. It does, yeah. So I'm always yeah. so interested to meet people like you that like on the other side of it, they're, mm -hmm. They're so empowered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some people, one critique will just will, will kill their creativity. Will kill it for for, for forever. Um, and uh, that's another reason why I'm, I'm glad my grandmother was was harsh with me when I was younger because I think I'm um, I'm uh, I, I can deal with criticism a little bit better uh, because because I, I had it when I was when I was very young. Um, but you know, I'm the same way with, with, with business. It's, it's interesting because you can always, you can always hire a bad cop. You can be the good cop, and you guys have you can always work with a bad cop who's gonna who's gonna do that for for people. Um, but with, when it comes to when it comes to families, I feel like it's that's a whole different thing. That's that's you 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 need both parents to be everything all at once. And uh, I would be the exact kind of parent. I, I would I would I would not give my kids any freedom. I put trackers on them. I would I would just I would be the worst. I'd make I'd make I'd make Joan Crawford look like Carol Brady. I I would be terrible. That's amazing. That's at least you're very self aware. So that's yeah. good. Um, I want to go back to drive and ambition. So you've accomplished a lot, and obviously it'd be very easy for somebody that has your kind of resume this young to just sort of tap out and coast on that for a while, mm -hmm. um, and then end up behind the eight ball because they don't have any career momentum. How do you stay hungry? Oh God, um, it, it is tough. It is because because sometimes it's you know, especially in the entertainment industry, the entertainment industry has a way of building you up and knocking it down and building it back up. It's it's such a roller coaster of, of emotions and. And it's 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 a business that is based on on uh, on creativity and opinion. So naturally, it, that's a it's a tough environment to to, to be in. Um, 
I, I know because I, cause I do go through those periods where I think I'm done. I, 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 th th this fight is too hard. A few, a few years ago, we, we started shopping around uh, the Land Stories adaptation to, to studios. And I was very, very adamant that I, uh, I, I wanted to, to, to direct this. I, I, I had written, I had screenwritten in the past and, and worked with some great directors. And I had screenwritten in the past and worked with directors that I, that I felt did not capture what I, what I was going for at all. And that is such a miserable place to be in, to, to see something you've created, uh, you know, being driven in, the, in a wrong direction. It's, it's like watching someone else parent your children, I, I, I can imagine. I, I can only imagine. Um, and so I was very adamant that, no, if this is, is going to come to life, I, I want to be the person to bring it to life. And I want to validate all those images that, 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 that the readers and I have created together. Um, and um, there was a period when we, we went to so many different studios, and every, because it had done well, every studio wanted it. They just didn't want to to give me the the, the creative the creativity and the, the control over it because I hadn't done it before, um, and at a, at a certain point I I I it was right when I had come to terms with okay you know this is this is not going to turn into a movie I I I could not live with this being a bad movie and I I unfortunately just I don't trust someone else to to make it a good movie so I'm just going to come to terms with this not being a movie and of course that was when the phone rang like, literally the next day um, and uh, 20, 20th Century Fox. Uh, 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 g gave me that opportunity. Um, so but there are moments like that where I, I, I do, I have many moments where I just want to give up. But I think you have to go through those moments. I think you have to go through those moments where you, where you want to give up. Um, I think that's part of the process. Tell me more, why? I don't know, I would love to tell you more, but, but I'm not <laughs> sure I know. <laughs> I, just, I said that, I think, I think that was right, what I said. Um, I know, I think that especially when you're, when, when you're in a creative position, I, I think the, the depths are, are just as important as, as the highs. I, I, I think that, that just it just broadens your, your spectrum as, as, as a creator. And um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's those moments of despair, I think that really made me a better writer because now I can write characters that are, that are in despair and people who are reading it who are actually in despair relate to it and, 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 it, and it helps them. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's ugh, life, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have a, a theory about what it is that makes that worthwhile. So the human mind is, is so Nassim Taleb has this idea of becoming anti-fragile. Mm -hmm. And the best example of a system that's anti-fragile is the immune system. So something that is weak obviously breaks easily. Something that is tough or resilient, uh, it can take a real beating and it will last a long time before it breaks, but it's ultimately still defined by its breaking point. Mm -hmm. Something that's anti-fragile actually gets stronger the more that it's assailed. Mm -hmm. So the human immune system is that, right? Yeah, so like when you're bones. born, it's like mm -hmm. everything makes mm -hmm. you sick and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But every time you get sick, your mm -hmm. immune system learns about that invader. And so the next time it can thwart that invader and that's how you yeah. get sick a lot less as you get older. So that's an example of a system that by attacking it, you're actually making it more powerful. So mm -hmm. I think the human psyche, mm -hmm. when done in sort of careful conditions, mm -hmm. is the same. Now you can break it, just like you can get so sick you die, mm -hmm. but if you are hit with these like um, stressors, mm -hmm. and there's a whole name for it, the, the um, hormesis, so you get this hormetic response, right? Something is bad, but not so bad that it kills you, so it actually makes you better, mm -hmm. right? So if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, but right. this like really on a biological level. Mm -hmm. So when you're going through this despair, the bad news is that maybe something like eight out of the 10 writers that encounter that it mm -hmm. kills them forever yeah. and they never go back to it yeah. but the two like you that make it and they push through they become a better writer they're more relatable but they're also more resilient and they will have learned a trick a path mm -hmm. so one thing i think that's so critically important is when you hit a hardship and you overcome it what you just learned your nervous system learns at a deep limbic level is that there was a path here even though i couldn't see it in the beginning mm -hmm. And so the next time you hit an obstacle, like the next time you want to do a project and they're like, no, 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 no. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been through this routine mm -hmm. before. Right, right. And if I really believe it and I stay true to it, eventually like people are going to break. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, it's a dangerous game. And it mm -hmm. really is something that um, I often liken it to the inner cities. The inner cities destroy most of the people that they touch, mm -hmm. but the occasional Jay-Z comes out mm -hmm. and they're just unstoppable. Yeah. It, it's unfortunate for some people what, you know, it, you, you you want to apply that that phrase what doesn't kill you makes you stronger to 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 the mental side of things too but sometimes what doesn't kill you makes you suicidal yeah. 
Um, and it's really up to you to, well, is, am I going to let this kill me or am I going to let this motivate me? And, um, and I, I, sometimes when I hear people say this, I want to throw things at them. So I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it, uh, with, with very tongue in cheek, but sometimes it really is, it's, it's a choice. Um, it, it's not a choice. I, I don't know. Sometimes I don't think your, your, sometimes I, I don't think your, your, your point of view or your, 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 um, interpretation of something you're going through can be a choice. Sometimes things are just so tragic that, that, um, you 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 just have to feel whatever you're feeling so it, so it can work at work itself out. Talk to me about your going into YA novels. So I know that you go there because you've said that that's it was so impactful for you growing up, and it's the space that you love to be in. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you're, any kind of relationship you're trying to forge with your reader? Is there anything that you want them to get out of it? Is it pure escapism? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you approach it as a writer? It really, I think it really is just escapism for, for me. That was what I enjoyed reading the most when I was a kid. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of just like where, where I'm, how I'm wired. I'm, I'm kind of wired uh, to live part-time in reality, part-time in a, in, a, in a fantasy world. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think when I was a kid, fan, like, like the things I said earlier, the fantasy really impacted me more than any other genre that I, that I had read. Um, and uh, I, I think stimulating imagination is one of the greatest things, one of our best lines of defense that we can, that we can give to the next generation coming. Um, because I, I think that's where, you know, if you, if you inspire people to be more compassionate and more curious, then I, I think the world is, is, is on the right track. How do you do that? How do you inspire that curiosity? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't know. I I I try to write the kind of books that I would like to read as 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 a young person. I always joke that I just write my reading level and it works out. Um, uh, I don't know. I I think I, I think I I think about the books that I read as a kid, um, and not just the Harry Potter series, but every book by Bruce Coville and every book by uh, Ava Botson and 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 just like that that. Like 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 that um, prelude to 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 a book. That that is like that's where I, I think my soul lives. Is it, my favorite part about writing the book is is right before I actually sit down and start writing, it and I'm just daydreaming about it. And I, I and I'm curious about oh what what is this where, where is this world going to take me? Who am I going to meet? What am I going to learn? What kind of fun am I going to have? Uh, uh, what's the end result going to be? Um, and uh, uh, I think every kid every time they they pick up a book. Um, and they read the first chapter, that, that's kind of where they're at. And I think if more people lived there, we would, uh, I think the world would be a much better place. Like I said, I, I think imagination is the greatest tool in the whole world. What is it about imagination? Are you using that in a Einstein way of imagining a path forward? Or is it just the relief from your day-to-day -day life where you can escape into a fantasy land? What do you mean by imagination? I think, I think for me, imagination is, is, is uh, uh, what you can create nothing and make something from nothing is what is is what you know nothing plus imagination equals something um, and uh, uh, that's also the the same definition of magic that I use um, in in my books so uh, I think imagination is is the most magical thing we have in the real world there's a notion in your books of portals mm -hmm. of being sucked into the story world mm -hmm. That made me feel like I might be getting an insight into you as a person. Mm -hmm. What is it about the notion of portals mm -hmm. that uh, was so enticing that you base so much of your story around that? Oh, probably because I, I hate reality so much. <laughs> God, I mean, I, I think I just, I would, if I had the, the choice of, of visiting Wonderland or Neverland or Hogwarts or Narnia, I wouldn't a harpy. Like, like there, it would be, there would be no question in my mind. Um, uh, yeah, no, funny. It's like a therapy session. Um, <laughs> thanks. I don't, I don't have to go this week. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, but uh, no, I think I think it's just I think it's just escaping it. I think it's go going someplace where where you you can you can be appreciated. You you can be loved and and um, and you, you can have adventures and, and fun that you you just maybe aren't available available to you just yet um, in, in whatever your situation is. Yeah. So as you progress obviously there are a lot of doors and things open to you if you could only mm -hmm. ever write mm -hmm. or sing mm -hmm. but not both so if you write you can never sing again if you sing you can never write again which which path would you choose oh right that's so that's so easy that's uh, i mean I can, I can write in my pajamas that's you know i, I, I 
Singing has always terrified me, strangely enough. Interesting. Yeah, I... Um, the performance element? The performance or? element, absolutely. Yeah, um, uh, Yeah, I, I've always had horrible stage fright. Even when I was a kid and I used to just sing at um, in choir at my, you know, my grandma's church or, or something. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I remember we did, we did a, this huge Glee tour. We did, I think, like 70 performances in, in a two-month span. And Whoa. we did, like, I, it, was, it was insane. And, and I, sang, I sang live every single uh, performance because I was trying to get that fear out of my system. And uh, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. I was, I was just as terrified on the last night as I was the first night. Interesting. I don't know. Um, I don't think about it very much because um, I just don't really think of it as a... As a possibility, I don't know why I don't. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I've always wanted to maybe do um, like a maybe a cover album that 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 has some kind of charity uh, aspect to it, where I, you know, I, I cover some songs and the money goes to you know the the LGBT center in LA or or the Trevor Project or or um, Make a Wish or something. Um, I would love to do that, um, but um, it's 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 that's a it's a tough thing to accomplish in the in the, the music industry. So fucking interesting. When was it's the first so time that somebody mm -hmm. told you that your voice was just fucking extraordinary? Extraordinary? Extraordinary. They cannot fathom. I, I think this right now. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, thanks. The first yeah. time I heard you sing, I was like, yeah. what? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, you know, people have been very kind over the years, sending letters and, and tweets and, 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 and whatnot. Um, I don't know. This is, this is, very, this is very deep. This is, we, we've, we've scratched the surface of something here. Yeah. That's it's, super but it's so interesting because, like I said, I, 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 have, I have been, I have been told my, my whole life that I couldn't do other things like writing and, and, and acting and, and not and, and for whatever reason I always had a, a deaf ear to, to those things. But like for whatever reason I, I, I accepted the, the, the critiques of of, of, the, of the singing. I am literally beside myself. With oh shock. really? So there are two gifts that I. It's interesting that I call them gifts. Talk about therapy. Mm. Um, there are two talents mm -hmm. that I have hangups about because I want them so desperately, do not have them. Mm -hmm. And as much work as I've done around getting rid of a fixed mindset, these are the two things that I think, if you really want it that bad, like why don't you mm -hmm. put in any energy? And the truthful answer is because I don't think that I would get good. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would get better, mm -hmm. I recognize that, but I don't think I would ever get good and that's singing mm -hmm. and drawing. Mm -hmm. And I remember before I met my wife, mm -hmm. I said, I can describe who she is mm. and she will either be able to sing or draw mm. and of course my wife can draw world-class artist yeah. absolutely ridiculous she completes you. yeah yeah like mm. that i so love that skill set mm -hmm. so hearing you sing and thinking okay wait a second like mm. a you run a show mm -hmm. you win a golden globe you win a bunch of other awards mm. like ardent fan base it's it is so fascinating mm -hmm. a glimpse into the human condition to think that that's an area that you're still like, yeah, I'm not sure if I could do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I used to say, I think I'm the only person in the world who doesn't consider myself a singer. Like when I, when I'm introduced places and people say, oh, well, please welcome stage singer, Chris Golfer. I'm always like, what? Yeah. All right. Well, all right, cool. I'll be, I'll take it. I'll take it. But yeah, it's so, yeah, it's, it's really, it's interesting. I should, I should, yeah. Huh. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe this, this, interview will change that. Maybe, maybe I'll get an offer. On. Yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, that's super, <laughs> super intriguing. My, my wheels are spinning. Um, where can people find out more about you? Oh, gosh. Um, America's Most Wanted. Uh, no. Um, nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, the landofstories.com is a good place. Uh, a tale of magic.com is a good place. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I, I guess just hit me up on social media. Yeah, and, uh, and interviews like this. Nice, yeah. perfect. Before I ask my last question, I actually want to sneak in a, a little bonus here. Mm. What do you, what is the trait that you have that's made you so successful? You know, the first word that came to mind was was delusion. I'll take it. I, I think yeah, I think it's delusion. I, I think um, like I said earlier, I think I um, I owe that to my grandmother. She she truly made me believe that every single one of my goals, every single one of my goals was 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 possible and I, I believed her and 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 because she gave that to me as a kid I, I think I um I I I that that's really what that was the secret ingredient to my success I'm good with that yeah all right what's the impact that you want to have on the world oh my gosh um I I think I just want I, I want to make uh the real world reality uh just a little bit more bearable for 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 people um and I, I want to bring a little, a little magic to, to, uh, to people's lives. That's a great answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Guys, there are a few people that I think have the breadth of creativity that he has. He's really doing extraordinary things. So if you only know him from TV or you only know the books to really look at his life across all the things that he's doing and hopefully we will very shortly see the results of him as a producer and director uh, and screenwriter of his own translated work. That'd be pretty extraordinary. So I highly encourage you to give him a follow. Uh, check out his book series. Uh, it's all very, very impressive. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Chris, Thank that was amazing, so dude. So kind of Thank you, so man. Scott, but what is it within my power? It's rather it's getting the proper sleep, rather it's learning your lines, rather it's researching the character, rather it's watching movies for reference, rather it's picking a, a subject matter, a, a person to study, or working out, or eating healthy, or...